Hello, everyone, and welcome to the second webinar of Recovering Troubled Projects, a short course presented by IT Masters on behalf of Charles Sturt University. Thanks for joining us. My name is Guy, and I'll MC this webinar, and your mentor is Brenton Birchmore. Before we begin, a few words on Zoom's webinar functions. Uh, we encourage the asking of questions and the use of chat during the webinar, and there are two ways to do so that we use. Uh, we ask that you direct all course content related questions to the Q&A section and that you send all administration type questions uh, and tech support questions to the, the support team in chat. You can chat with panellists only if you'd like, uh, if, if it's a, a private matter or to all of your fellow students as well. And you can make that choice by toggling through the drop down box once you've opened the chat log. There are usually some very experienced industry based attendees who will be most helpful with any queries you might have or just discussion points that you might want to throw out there. Um, and we'll also have a, a Q&A Q &A sessions periodically. Um, if, if questions are particularly relevant, I'll interrupt Brenton. Chantelle is again here to moderate and respond in Zoom chat and questions. Uh, she's also responsible for the learn.itmasters.edu website or the Moodle page, which is where you'll find all the other materials needed for this course. Pre-recorded lectures, discussion forums and quizzes, uh, and the slides for each module. Uh, the slides for, for this webinar are, are now up on the, on the Moodle page. At the end of this session, I'll be giving a, a, a brief presentation on CSU and Spruik the Master's program that this short course corresponds to, uh, and which might be something to consider if you, if, if you enjoy the content of this course down the track. As I said, we'll also have a Q&A session at the end of, this, uh, at the, end of the webinar. Um, we'll try and get through it all um, before the, uh, the end of the lunch hour. Could you please welcome Brenton? Thanks very much, Guy. Hello, everyone. Good evening, good morning, and good afternoon. And where am I? Oh, there I am. I'm over there. Sorry, folks. Anyway, we're talking here. Hello. <laughs> right. Uh, thanks for tuning back in, everyone. We have a more detailed discussion today, so we're planning to go into a little more detail about where the trouble comes from, and we're going to categorize it, and then we're going to talk about some practical tools and tips about what can be done depending on the nature or the category of failure that we might be facing. So we'll talk about uh, we'll talk about all this. That at the end, at the last few minutes, we'll have a bit more information about CSU and its uh, its courses and its subjects. So we'll cover that at the end with uh, with Guy. I also just want to give a quick reminder to the Podoco uh, Scenario Learning Engine. We've had uh, tons of people log into that, which is terrific. We've had some great feedback already. Uh, we've had lots of people participating, which is which is excellent. Uh, the there is going to be a support page uh, set up in the next couple of days, so that will be a place in from the portal where you can go to. Uh, directly lodge any problems uh, or, or report anything or give any feedback. Uh, there are some people who are still having some problems, etc., logging in. So you can send an email to support at podoco.com or you can post in the Podoco forum. But uh, when you do have problems and you're letting us know, give us as much information as you can about uh, exactly what went wrong or where it went wrong or uh, even send a screenshot or something like that if you can. And that'll help us diagnose and help us help you. But uh, we've had hundreds of people already uh, join in and participate and all of that feedback is fabulous. So, so thanks for all of that. Uh, if there's anyone that does have any gameplay questions of how to do anything, then you can put those in the forums. And there's, there's now lots of people who are familiar with it, who've been playing it, who also might be able to help and, and add some advice and, and comment along the way. So we're going to talk about failure and really we could talk about failure, project failure all day. Uh, it's something that seems never ending, the different varieties and sources of or causes of project failure. What we're going to do is not look at particular failures. We're not going to look at specifics because when you start to look at the specifics, you start to look at very detailed forms of cause and effect. And then the context of the project really starts to become important and the context of the organization. So we're gonna talk about this from a much more conceptual point of view. And to do that, we've broken down the types of project failure or trouble, if you like, into three different types of cause and effect. So the first we're looking at is those that originate from the business itself. Now the most obvious and starting point for this is the business case. 
But when we talk about a business case kind of failure, there's actually a much broader uh, set of uh, definitions and things that can go wrong than simply uh, having a bad justification. Now, we know that projects with a poor justification are going to have struggles of some kind, but there's more to it than that. And there's a whole range of things that can possibly go wrong with caused by the business not having a proper handle on the value question. So we're going to explore that in a little more detail. We're then going to look at the kinds of things that can happen to a project, even if the business case is sound, but the project is being meddled with. And when we're talking about leadership here, we're not talking about the leadership of the project necessarily. We're talking about anyone who might have the power to cause some distress for our project. So anyone with any sort of leadership function who might want to do something or achieve something and that runs counter to our project. So we'll talk about what causes those and we'll talk about philosophically how we approach it. And lastly, uh, the, the fairly obvious one is the performance type of problem. So this is where the project itself is not performing adequately. Uh, it may be something that the project is uh, not, the project team is not adequate, the project management is, is weak or has difficulties. And this is sort of the traditional type of project failure that most people outside of the project are likely to think of. So this is the three we're going to go through. So let's go through these in a little more detail. Now, I do want to remind you, if you have any questions, use the Q&A uh, section uh, for any key questions, and we'll pause and grab those as we go. If it's a background question, uh, feel free to use the, the chat box and uh, uh, Chantel Guy or others might be able to answer that along the, on the way. Now let's talk about business failure in a bit more detail because this is, the obvious one is when the business case is inadequate in some way. And this is fairly straightforward. We've, we've all probably seen projects where the business case was flawed. And obviously this project is going to struggle and it's not necessarily going to struggle with its constraints. How this manifests as trouble might not be in the case of the project reports. And the real problem with this is that it might not get detected until it's already reached a point where there's a major difference between what's being done in the project and what's being expected or what value that's going to bring or is expected to bring. So this is one that can really sneak up on us. And this is one of the more common causes of projects going red because it's something that is difficult to identify early on. But because it's so profound in the way the project can be affected, it means that we may have a problem that the project and all the great things that it might be doing isn't considered valuable for the business. And this could be the case because uh, you might have people who were involved in those early discussions that had the wrong information. They might have had a voice that was too loud. They might have not had as much of a stake in the outcomes as their contributions suggested. Or people who did have or should have had a real stake in what was happening didn't get enough of a voice. And that's one way that you can have the wrong level of information or the wrong volume of things being taken into account. But you can also have assumptions being made. You can have uh, people relying on guesswork, people relying on uh, even sales strategies where somebody else says, hey, this is going to be great. Let me tell you how wonderful it's going to be and you'll want this. And they do. And then they say, well, we, we, we need a project that's going to do all these great things for us because I'm sold on the idea that this will happen. You know, it's very much a case of you know, if, they, if we build it, they'll come. And of course, that's not how projects work. But this results, whether it's caused from people being left out, the wrong sort of voices, the wrong sort of information, the net result of all of these different causes of a problem at the beginning is unrealistic expectations and assumptions about the value of the project. So that's what it distills down into. Now, if we can say, okay, so it really doesn't matter yet where the source of all these value-based problems have come from. They can all be loosely categorized as being expectation related or assumptive. So this gives us some clues as to how we might tackle this, how we might go about dealing with these kinds of issues. But it's not just about the beginning of a project. We know that things can go wrong with the initial expectations, but the other part of it is that things can change. And either the business 
or the project isn't adapting well to those changes. Now you could have changes that directly come from the business where the business is changing its strategy. It might be changing its strategic goals. It might be saying, well, we're going to tackle this market now, or uh, we no longer need to tackle that market because we've just bought a competitor in that market. And suddenly this project that was meant to compete with them is obviated because we now own them. And there are things like this that can mean a strategic change for the organization is and should manifest directly in changing the goals of the project. And if that's underhandled, let alone poorly, but if it's just not adequately handled, you get a massive misalignment that can then cause the project to be considered in serious trouble later. You can also have other types of changes like technology change. New options, new technologies come about that mean that our project might need a, a big rethink on what it's doing and the value of what it's going to deliver because technology has moved on. Ultimately, it comes down to there's some sort of misalignment between the business strategy, the business goals, the business expectations, and what they think is going to happen with the project's direction. So it's a value problem. And the fact that it's a value problem is what guides us in finding the tools to deal with it. Now, one of the points behind this discussion and looking at these different tools is that this isn't just about what do we do when it's all too late? This is about recognizing the kinds of signs and signals that say, well, we're approaching that point. We are seeing signs that perhaps our project is going into warmer colors and we want to maybe do something about it before it goes completely red. So what are some of the tools that we use? Now, these, these are conceptual tools. This isn't a procedure. This isn't a guidebook because it's going to depend entirely on the business, the business, its own leadership, uh, the context of the project. There are so many specifics that are going to be applicable. But, and this sounds very sort of obvious tongue in cheek, but usually one of the biggest things that is missing from the analysis is the use of logic. And that sounds like a bit of a throwaway line. Well, you know, of course, if we were logical about it, we wouldn't be making mistakes. Well, we bring the logic by asking the question of why. So simply by asking for the reason why of something, we are triggering by necessity, we are triggering a more logical analysis of whatever the situation, whatever the question is, whatever the consideration or the decision. When we have that deeper understanding of why, quite often any weaknesses or failures or lack of logic in those decisions will become a little more apparent. Now that doesn't automatically mean that that'll fix it, but this is the first step and us in project management, the why is within our domain. That is our tool. We are in a position to say, I need to understand the reason for this so that we can properly understand it, prioritize it and contextualize it in the project. So we're allowed to ask why. It doesn't mean that we challenge or question stakeholders who might have more authority over us. We're not saying, well, we don't trust you, explain yourself. We're saying, help me understand why this is the case. Help me understand the logic behind this. And they'll give a logic. That logic might be subjective. It might be an opinion based on assumptions and guesses. Well, our next step would be to validate whatever information is presented as logic fait accompli and say, well, what might we do to confirm this? And our first step in project management is to go for the multiple sources of information. So we have usually assumptions start with individuals and they spread outwards from that. If we can early enough have conversations with other individuals and say, what's your take on this? What's your view of this, of this logic, of this explanation, of this reasoning? of this understanding. And this gives us a way of validating from multiple stakeholders, any one perspective of value. A third therefore leans to alignment. So when we have value, subjective value assessments within the project where stakeholders are saying, I love this and I think it's great and I want this. Well, we need to find the stakeholder that says the opposite. Now, as humans, we do this as a validation process all the time. 
Uh, one great example that happened to me literally this morning, you, you, you're looking for a new app on whatever app store that you're looking for and you look at the reviews and there's a few reviews that are five star reviews and you think, well, they're probably biased. Let me read the review from the one star person who had some problem and you, you read the five star and the one star. You want to see both because you want to see what someone had to complain about. And this is human nature and the way in which we validate certain information. We look for an opposing view and compare it. We can use a similar technique by tapping into different stakeholders. Now, we're not the ones to turn around to a stakeholder and say, oh, no, I, I don't agree with you. I think your value assumptions here are, are out of place. And I think this won't. That's not necessarily our role. Our role is to find out if anyone else feels that and to get that voice a space and allow it to be heard. So we can take it into account. The goal of all of this is to ensure that we have the most realistic information that we are working with. Value is still going to be subjective. It's still going to be something that different people will have a different view about. It's not going to be clearly quantified. But the more logic we can have present in these discussions, the more that logic can be tested by the input from different people, the more alignment we can get between people seeing it the same way, the more realistic our value justification will end up being. But this isn't a one-time event. Yes, we do a lot of this in the beginning, but this is something that may need to be revisited at various points along the way. Let me see a question that's just come up. Uh, Denali's asking, do you mean that while a project is executed or initialized, management has to continuously check for if it's still valid in the business case or strategic goals of the project sponsor? So we know already that it's something that has to happen in the initial stages. So part of what I'm saying here is that the initial justification of the project could be flawed. And it's part of our role in taking on the project to bring some tests to that to find those flaws and have them improved upon. But the answer to the question is yes, there are still points in the project where we need to stop and check, is what we decided at the beginning still valid today? And some methodologies um, are more likely to prompt us to do that than other methodologies will. So you'll find that, you know, Agile is asking us to do that every sprint. You'll find that Prince2 is asking us to do that at every management stage. So there are different mechanisms we can use in project methodologies to help us do this. But we have to also understand that if we don't, then the value judgment question may deviate because we in the project may not know what strategic changes have occurred within the organization's goals and strategies that really should affect our project because that's not part of our bubble. So we need to make sure that we are triggering the kinds of conversations that test for that. Had a couple more come in if you've... Yeah, let's tackle those. So uh, yeah. we have a question saying, I'm currently experiencing unex unexpected bureaucratic delays, making it significantly impossible uh, to meet project timers. Um, you're talking about what I believe is the very next point. So I'll, I'll pause that question and I think we'll have some answers to that when we talk about leadership. Uh, Trevor's saying, sounds like a large time commitment. Recognize it might be necessary to use the tools, but can they be done with agility? So... What I'm talking about here, is, Trevor's correctly pointed out, th this takes effort. This takes time. And what you have to do is make a judgment call is, well, there's diminishing returns. How much realism do you need to get going with your project? How much risk and threat do you have with a misaligned uh, value proposition? And what I would venture is that it's far easier and more common for project managers to underappreciate the amount of damage that uh, value misalignment can have later and to overestimate the amount of effort and the annoyance of that effort in going through the initial stages or the intermediary stages of resolving the value question. Because in my experience, even the, the best run projects that are on time on budget and built to specification, if the value question is fails six months later, 12 months later for the rest of the, of the project's living memory, it'll be regarded as a failure. No one will remember the fact that it was on time or on budget. What they'll remember is that they don't want it. 
They don't need it. They can't use it. It's no good to them. And so the value proposition nearly always trumps every other aspect of uh, the project's criteria. And that, that last one that came in is connected to the first. The first one. All right. So I'm, I'm gonna ask, yeah, I'm going to ask to hold that question to see if we can cover it in the yep. next one. So let's yep. summarize this first point. Uh, bias and uncertainty are really, and the assumptions that lead from that, that's the problem. That's what we're trying to deal with. And let's face it, it's human nature. If there's no point in us criticizing business leadership as being you know, incompetent, weak, ineffective for simply being human. So we need to do the logic steps that allow us to test and find out what we can do to get the truth of that situation. So let's talk about leadership failure. And I'm clarifying here that leadership is not project leadership. It's all of the leadership uh, and all of the authority and power that exists outside of our project bubble that can directly influence our project. And they can influence in some surprising ways. So this is people who, who have some power to mess with our project. And they don't necessarily want to undermine our project. This is not necessarily about sabotage. It's not that there are people who are against us. It's that everyone is for themselves. So you have decisions that occur, for example, decisions about resources that we might be dependent upon. People that are meant to be allocated to our team that get delayed because their line manager doesn't want to let them go. And so that line manager is making a decision that suits their goals and objective without necessarily realizing the full extent of what happens to our project. They might say, well, look, you know, I know Fred and Mary from my team are meant to go and, and work in the project next week, but look, I'll just delay that a week because I need Fred and Mary here and look, Brent and the project manager will figure it out. So what that manager isn't possibly able to take into account is what is the true impact on the project of that decision? It comes down to the fact that the project is a project and it is managed as a project because it's, it has this massive web of interdependencies. Everything affects something else. And it's our role as the project manager to know this, to manage this, to plan for this, uh, to accommodate it. And we know that where that is threatened, that cause and effect, it's a risk. And we usually have a risk register. We write that stuff down, right? That's important to us. Things that are a threat to cer certain constraints in our project. But all of the people outside of our project, they don't know that. And often they don't care about that. But more often, they don't think about that. They don't even ask the question, what, what effect could this have on the project? And so there's a, a million kinds of possible isolated decisions that can unknowingly, unwittingly damage our project. And the more it happens, the more that the people making those decisions they get comfortable with the fact that, well, Brenton's project can just cope with it. Obviously, he didn't complain last time. You know, we did this and we did this and we did this and he, he just managed. I mean, it's, it's a big project. He's got lots of flexibility. I'm sure he's got some padding in the scope, right? This becomes a sentiment. The sentiment becomes a culture, becomes a mindset. And when that happens, we are heading towards a nest of problems that can end up sending our project red. So we might have had a great business case. Our value justification might be terrific, but it's the people around the project that are making constant decisions and aren't necessarily willing or interested in talking about the effects of those decisions. And our project may be constantly suffering and struggling from not just one source. And this is part of the problem. We could say, oh, look, uh, our project needs more power and authority, but it's quite possible that these decisions are coming from so many different sources that there's no one single point of power or authority that can curb all of these challenges unless you go right to the top. And quite often, you know, your, your CEO isn't going to want to get involved in solving our little power struggles with our project. But that could be how diverse the different sources of these sorts of problems may come from. So if we distill all of this down into a category, a type of problem, what we have is decisions made outside of the project that are made out of context with what the project needs and are therefore considered isolated decisions. 
they are a decision which affects the project, but was not made with taking the project into account. Now, th we can't stop these. They, they will happen. There will be tons of them. The problem we need to face is, at what point does this become a, a threat to the colour of our project? When might this start to have our project pushed towards warmer colours? Usually, these things will manifest themselves within the project tolerances and constraints. If we are having things happen around us that mean that resources are late, funding is late, uh, et cetera, we might have schedule, uh, schedule issues if, or, or we might have cost issues. If people unexpectedly start charging us for work that we weren't expecting to be charged for or telling us we need to use a different supplier for policy reasons or for whatever else, you could have budgetary impact. You could have quality impact because the quality goal posts are changing. So all of this means that we need a way of helping people understand the impact of any decision. First of all, we need to be clear that there is an impact. And quite often the very first step is letting some other stakeholder know and say, hey, uh, that decision has an impact on the project. Are, are you aware of that? The answer might be, oh, no, I didn't think about that. Can I share with you the impact of what this will do to our project so that you can take that into account? Uh, hopefully they say, yeah, okay, you let me know. And the idea is we want to help them understand the impact. It's not their job to know what the impact is. You could even argue in many cases, it's not their job to know that there even is an impact. Sometimes it should be kind of obvious, but at other times it's not. It is entirely our role to deeply understand that kind of interdependence. That's us. We, we have to know that. So with our understanding of the full web of interdependence, we can then, then help others see in adequate detail the effects that their decisions will have on our project. Now, what we often need to do from a personality and a political point of view is avoid contextualizing these kinds of discussions as a complaint or a pushback. And this is not a case of saying, hey, you know, uh, don't make that decision. That messes with my project and I don't like it when people mess with my project. So fix it, change it, take it away. That's not our approach. People have to get their jobs done. People have to have their requirements met. There is a world of compromise that we live within. So the first step is to have people fully aware and informed. A percentage of them will make a slightly different decision simply for having been made aware of it. Another percentage uh, can be prompted when seeing the full consequence of the impact, can be prompted to influence their decision. Another percentage won't. But what has happened with that final percentage is that they've been given a clear opportunity to make a different value judgment about the decision that they are faced with. If they choose to choose their value over the project's value, then we have been through enough of the process that we can then trigger a second interaction. So we've said, okay, well, we've had a discussion with a decision maker. Uh, they have decided that uh, they don't agree with our position and that they shouldn't have to alter their decision. So they're going to go ahead in some way. We might, knowing the interdependencies as we do, we might bring in some other stakeholder, a stakeholder who is more directly detrimentally affected by whatever decision has been made. We let them know, say, okay, so we're just letting you know this has occurred, this decisions have occurred, uh, this is the impact on our project, this is how we can mitigate that, you know, we're, we're not helpless here, uh, but this is what we're doing about it. This is the steps we've taken to inform this other stakeholder, um, and this is what they've actually done after that. And now our other stakeholders might say, okay, well, that's bad news, but thanks for letting me know. That means that we have a mandate to accept the impact. It means that it's not going red. We've shifted the goalposts and we need to formalize that because there, we have a stakeholder who is accepting of new, lesser outcomes and impacts. But a stakeholder might say, look, I'm, I don't think that's a good idea. I'm not happy with that. Our job is not to be the meat in the sandwich. Our job is to say, well, 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 you and them have a chat about it, perhaps. So from that point of view, we then get to facilitate the kind of interstakeholder interactions that are necessary to further enhance their understanding of the full impact of the decisions being made. 
And if that's still not working for us, then we use risk management. Risk management, totally our job, totally our, our domain, our area of expertise. We need to record the risk. So we record the risk that, well, this decision was made, that has threatened schedule, that has threatened quality, that has threatened budget. This is the flow on effect. It's in the risk register. And anytime we are reporting up to project sponsors and project board and project uh, senior leadership, executive leadership about the status of the project, our risk register is saying, well, here's our risk register. And we have some risks regarding project satisfaction and success because of these decisions. Now, if the project sponsor and the project board are saying, let's accept those risks, well, then we need to formalize the fact that, right, we've escalated that and we've got a new benchmark for risk appetite. We're prepared to accept those. So that way we've formalized the whole process. We've started informally, but we've got all the way up to the fully formalized process of having all of these potentially isolated decisions from impacting our project. Let's check the questions uh, and uh, see. So the first question, unexpected bureaucratic delay. So delays in decision-making, do they know what the impact would be on our project? We need to be able to quantify that for them uh, as much as possible. So we need to be able to come back and say, understand you haven't made the decision yet. Uh, just want to let you know, here it is on paper, the consequences of another week's delay. It's going to have this cascade effect. And in you know, 12 months time, this is what you're looking at. Now, that's entirely up to us as project managers. And if we can't map that and show that, then we're not doing ourselves uh, any justice. So we have to be able to provide that information. But that information is the only tool that we have to help inform people because ultimately it's their decision. So the client introducing more hurdles is another example. If a client wants scope creep, now you then need to look at, is this a value question? Are you looking at simply that they don't realize that they're messing around with their value? Or is this a symptom that their value proposition may be changing and we need to revisit that ergo point one? Now, that's a decision that you'll need to make. Uh, Narendra saying, are you suggesting that value and benefits need to be called out in a business case and quantifiable? Often they're very hard to quantify. Uh, it's much, often, much more often a qualitative assessment. Um, but what I am saying is that you as the project manager, you need to be sufficiently satisfied that whatever tests the business case passed was sufficiently rigorous. You are meant to represent the standards of rigor. Now, if the project leadership turns around and says, ah, oh, don't worry about that. Uh, you know, just go ahead and do what we're telling you to do. Uh, okay. So if, if that's truly the approach of project leadership, uh, and they're not really wanting to spell it out and, and let you pass those rigor tests, uh, then, well, you, you have to go into that project with your eyes open, knowing that you have a major risk about whether or not value is going to be considered acceptable by the end. Had an interesting comment just on, on Narendra's question, actually, uh, from Scott, um, who says yeah, he, that perhaps you shouldn't document what you can't measure. Um, and then they, they go on for, to give an example of... Um, having benefits in the cost benefit analysis that are expected to be realized in 20 years time, but because they can't be effectively measured, um, they, they leave them elsewhere. They don't actually include them in the, in the cost benefit analysis. Just and this, any comments yeah. on that? Well, it's a very good point because uh, what I was alluding to earlier is that benefits are emotional. Now, unless there's a pure dollar figure and the accountant can come forward and say, here's the money you're going to earn. Everything else is emotionally subjective and people are going to differ on how they feel about it. So when you include things that can't be measured into a benefit statement, they, what they do do is they add to the emotional weight. So they add to the emotional credibility. So I feel good about the fact that this might happen. You know, I feel good about the fact that I might win the lottery next year. And that makes me feel good today. And that'll influence what I do today, including buying a ticket. Doesn't mean I've got any greater chance of winning. So I agree with the idea, look for the, the ones that add emotional weight to decisions, to value judgments, but which are unquantifiable because then they shouldn't be there. Because the problem is the project will get judged on whether that amorphous, uncertain, unverifiable thing was delivered. Because that's part of the emotional expectation of the people who got involved in that decision. 
I, we should definitely push back on those. Then I was saying, if the risk is really serious, could this prompt, prompt the project to be cancelled? Um, I, I, I certainly think it could. I, I think a, a risk a risk has to be pretty serious to cancel a project. Uh, the risk, if it manifests, has to cause the kind of damage that would uh, completely void the value of the project if it was completed, or maybe the risk, the likelihood of the risk is so high. So the risk isn't necessarily going to be canceled, but the risk may require, so usually what, what happens with risks is that we look at how we can mitigate or avoid them, and that's investment. And when decision-making, is listed as a risk. You then say, well, how do we invest in mitigating this risk? Okay, so the, the, the simple logic of that says, well, if we want to mitigate against the risk of poor decisions, let's make better decisions. How do we do that? Well, let's discuss it a bit more. Let's get a few more people in the discussion and let's, let's validate this and let's, let's keep going until we've dealt with all the naysayers and we've dealt with all the negative points of view and everyone has come to a, the similar conclusion. Well, then we can move on and say, okay, this decision is less of a risk now. So listing it as a risk and then applying avoidance and mitigation uh, principles to it is the method of triggering sensible discussion around decisions. Uh, Jennifer was saying, when is failure just governance rather than leadership? I, I'm putting them together. And, and I haven't spelt this out here. It's a, bit, it's a little bit clearer in the pre-recorded audio, but governance is included here. It got failures of governance. So Governance can be good or it can be bad. Now, in the next one, I'm going to talk about governance as a good thing. But when governance fails, uh, if governance is applied to a project without full regard to its impact on the project, then governance can be a, a source of concern and problem. So in those sort of situations, that is simply another form of external power and influence being applied uncontextually. That's what it is in a nutshell. And if that happens, then we need to go back to the source of governance and say, right, you've asked us to adhere to this, and this is the impact on the project. Uh, can you sign off on that? Your project's going to be a month late. It's going to be 10% over budget. We're not going to be able to deliver this because you want us to do it your way. And that's fine. You're entitled, your compliance, your governance. You can make us do these sorts of things. Here's the impact. You okay? And then you get that signed off, and then you've moved the goalposts doesn't matter whether it's from it's 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 contained within uh, governance or some other mechanism so it's the broadening of the scope of the discussions to use context as the over overarching guide it's got to be within context the full context uh, Ivan saying project cancellation is itself a risk mit mitigation yes yes it is it's a pretty drastic one um, Early question, a domestic uh, project manager for project sponsor also have a project manager. Failing because the project sponsor is ignoring some key factor when implementing. How do I save this project? Projects are annoying some key factors. So if they're annoying, if it's a value key factor, uh, then we'd go back to the first one. Uh, there's one more. Let's see if I can answer the rest of that question regarding the, first, the, the third point. So let's cover this. Because there's some things here that, this is all conceptual, right? So quite often you have projects that are failing for more than one reason. And these aren't step-by-step -step things. These are uh, an approach. So let's talk about the third one, which is performance failure. So this is the classical one that, that everyone outside of the project likes to point to and say, you guys have messed this up. You project ninnies have made all these mistakes and it's not being run properly and project management has failed project delivery has failed we've heard the story right so these nearly always manifest themselves in the tolerances and the constraints and the reports so these are nearly always come to our attention because of the reports and the analysis the information of the project says that we're behind schedule it says that uh, tasks aren't being done. It says that things are costing too much, whatever the, sig the signal is. But that's where that information is coming from. And this is one of the reasons why lots of people say, oh, that means your project is busted. Your project management is, is messy or it's not working right because it's manifesting in those. Now, interestingly, what we just talked about with a lot of the extra context uh, leadership decisions around the project 
they can also manifest themselves in these tolerance reports, but they can manifest themselves in other ways. Here, these sorts of performance failures, they only come out as tolerance in tolerance reports. There's really no other way for us to, to see this really going on. Why do they exist? Uh, so this is, this is the unpleasant bit. They exist because truth is hidden. They exist because important pertinent facts about our project aren't reaching the attention of the decision makers who are meant to respond to those facts. So what this means is that we can't hold people accountable for things that they are unaware of. We can hold people accountable for making sure that they know what they need to be aware of. Actually, really, there's only one person that we can ultimately hold accountable for making sure they know what they need to know. And that's the project manager. Uh, so the buck stops there. And that means that when there is information that is hidden from that, the, the top of that food chain, it probably means it's being hidden at multiple steps along the way. So the failure of the project to meet various milestones and, and guidelines, et cetera, means not simply a failure of accountability, but a failure of the full and complete flow of information. Project performance failure can exist for only two reasons. I've only listed one here, but there are two. The first is an acceptance of the, the, poor, in, the poor quality of our project. The second is a lack of awareness of the poor quality of our project performance. So let's look at the first one. If we say, okay, well, we're, we're late, we're behind schedule, we're behind everything, and that's okay. Uh, well, the, the problem there is, of course, if that's not formally accepted, then we are, in fact, well outside of tolerances. If that is formally accepted, then that's our tolerances have shifted, and maybe we're no longer outside of our tolerances if it's been formally done. If it's being done because people are lazy or incompetent or not really following up, well, we can't really solve that through process. This is not something that we can conceptually say that if people just don't care enough about doing their jobs, that we can come along and fix that. Because we're talking about project management here. This is us. And I'm taking the assumption that we definitely want to do our jobs well and thoroughly and properly. So that means that the tools that we use are tools that give us all of the information in as accurate and as honest a format as we can all the way up to us. And I'm assuming that we are willing and ready to be fully accountable for that information. And that we then use that transparency to help ensure that other people are accountable and are aware of what they are accountable for. So the tools we use are honesty and that's a bit of a throwaway line by the sound of it. But the reality is being honest is about making sure that we get all of the information and we get it accurately and we get it consistently. Honesty is a principle and a practice. And it's one that we have to not merely talk about, but demonstrate ourselves. We have to not merely encourage it. We have to facilitate honesty. You can't force honesty. If you, if you force honesty too much with merely consequence and punishment and negative uh, reinforcement, then we're going, to, uh, we're going to encourage a more creative form of honesty. Honesty needs to be something we, we use the carrot, not the stick. Assurance is the mechanisms that we use that are the removal of trust, the removal of doubt, the removal of uncertainty. This is where we have additional processes which can create an overhead, they undoubtedly do. But they are mechanisms that allow us to make sure. And this kind of, Assurance brings a level of scrutiny, scrutiny on a team that the team often doesn't like. And we can sell that idea more effectively by helping them understand that if we rely on trust and that trust gets damaged, that we got nothing. We're, we're adrift and we can't recover from it. If we have a second mechanism that makes sure, we're no longer reliant upon trust. It means that we have much more power and influence within our project because we have certainty, not expectation or belief. When anomalies appear, we have to investigate them. And I, I've seen many projects that have gone into terrible conditions because the early warning signs weren't acted upon. That one little anomaly that might look like a little anomaly, if, if you know that the level of 
completeness and the level of accuracy in your reporting is in any way sus suspect, then that little one anomaly may be the tip of the iceberg. And we need to find out how big that iceberg really is. And once we've got all this working, we can then pass down accountability. We can delegate accountability. We can have people accountable for certain pieces of the project, trusting that they have uh, assurance, which means that they're definitely going to get the right information from multiple sources. They will find the anomalies. They'll act upon the anomalies and they'll address them because we are wanting to find the problems rather than point blame. It's not about who caused what. It's about what are we going to do about it next? Let's look at some of the, the questions and, and points made here. Uh, just while you're looking, questions? yeah, just, yeah, just while you're looking at that, well, um, I draw attention to the chat uh, where there's uh, some amazing. Uh, I'm not sure how they relate to the course exactly, but some amazing tools that people use to assist in the project management process. Uh, things like pink elephants wearing sombreros uh, for when people overpromise, uh, uh, wizard hats and wands, uh, and and procurement gnomes that do better than the procurement teams. Uh, really, really enjoying it. Um, <laughs> the questions themselves. Uh... <laughs> so, I have to, I have to say, um, operating in Asia, all these um, all these uh, humorous shaming mechanisms are very Australian in nature. I mean, they happen elsewhere, but um, these things these things don't land as well in Asia. These these concepts, uh, people don't get the joke quite as quickly. Uh, so you do need to be culturally sensitive to when and how you use some of these mechanisms because some of them, uh, some of them land with a splat. Uh, let's look at the questions. Uh, so I, I hope I've, I've helped answer the first one uh, a little more. I'll come back to that if not. Uh, so we've got a question. Uh, can we do, we do risk assessment, the initial stages before the project starts, have a risk matrix. You, you can do that. The problem, uh, I think what you're suggesting is, can you start the risk discussion even before you've finished the value proposition uh, and the value in initiation? Uh, you, you kind of can, but only as a warning bell. Uh, you can't quantify usually the full extent of impact uh, in terms of risk and what avoidance and mitigation might be necessary, but you can in a more abstract sense say, well, uh, if we don't finish these discussions, if we don't go into enough detail, we will run the risk of not knowing whether or not we've delivered what we want. Uh, and if we don't know what we want, uh, it's got to be pretty hard to be sure we're delivering it. And, uh, you know, this, the, the whole scary phenomenon of, you know, we could completely waste a great deal of time and effort and money. And, uh, you know, that's sort of a bit of a, a, of a looming monster that can hang over. The, and we can, we, can, we can wear that coat and bring that to the discussion of let's get our value discussion finished and thorough. Uh, Nicole's question, where do you see workplace organizational culture coming into this? Uh, you know, thinking that it's difficult to facilitate honesty if there isn't an underlying sense of safety in the organization. So that's a very good point. What happens when people just aren't comfortable being honest? So containment is, the, is, is one answer. Now, in the same way that the project manager has a very high degree of, of uh, accountability for making sure that the honesty works through the project, they also have uh, a greater level of authority for containing those kinds of investigations within the project. So if you have a poisonous, damaging, threatening culture outside of the project, but you're the project manager, you have the potential to alter that internally and say, right, I'm going to run the project this way. And we're going to have these kinds of channels that aren't subject to external scrutiny, that are going to be used for the honest sharing of information. And we're going to protect people from the external e examination of that because what the external examination should be looking at is what results in it. And that's, that sits with me as the project manager where I make my decisions and I justify it. So you're asking them to have a higher degree of trust in you. But if you set up the kinds of mechanisms and the kinds of containment around sensitive conversations that allow people a little more comfort to share, knowing that uh, the harsh judgment from outside the project might not affect them as much, then you can build a culture, a subculture that might run a little differently, but you can't necessarily change the culture of the organization. You can only subculture it is, is what I'm saying. Uh, we've, got, we've got a follow-up question to the, 
the one you answered just before that one. Uh, can we do some research and going through the previous work project done in there so we can cover the hindrances in the current project? Look, looking at prior projects is a terrific way of helping people understand that there's a lesson they probably should have learned last time. Now, the real problem with that is that those are often very subjective discussions. People will take entirely different lessons out of the same fact that you present them with. Um, and especially if they perceive it as a, as a somewhat conditioning or threatening statement. So, well, you know, we did this last time and look what happened people will get defensive and say, oh, no, that wasn't for that reason. That was because of something else. Because usually when you look at uh, the, the end game results of a project, they are the result of many different uh, contributing factors. So when the conversations get really tough and people get really defensive, uh, going back to look at other projects has limited value. It's still valuable. It's still worth doing. It's more effective when it happens right at the very beginning when you turn around to people and say, okay, these things didn't work out well last time. Before we go any further, let's just keep this in mind so we try to avoid any of the mistakes we made last time, regardless of what they were, and use it as a precursor. It's more effective. Uh, if you've already passed that stage, uh, then yes, but I would not necessarily think it's going to work aggressively or using it as a hammer. But he's asking how can you be prepared uh, to challenge something you don't think is the right culture? Um, well, I mentioned subculturing uh, uh, as a way of doing it, but it all depends on how you get your authority as project manager and where does that authority come from. So the authority you get comes from somewhere and your power to work against culture is going to come from that source. So, and you have to work within that limit. But if you have, if it comes from a relatively strong power, then you can get their mandate, not just for project management, but for cultural adjustments and have that conversation and say to your sponsor, say to your board, I want to take this opportunity to have some positive impact on cultural change regarding this, this, and this. You don't need to be a crusader. You just say, let's have a positive impact. Uh, and can you support me with this uh, from, from a, a empowerment point of view, you get their support and then you have a much higher level of power to make other changes within it. Your answer to Kevin's question might be a nice segue into the end of the lecture as well. Um, yep. talking about uh, whether whether there is specific teaching within the project management learning that pays specific attention to culture. There is, but uh, yes, there is. We'll, we'll, we'll finish off and then, and then go into the, let's talk about CSU and you can maybe provide some insights into which subjects you've actually designed being most of them for the project management <laughs> master. Um, Kevin, I'm, I'm going to leave you with this teaser of uh, uh, wait for next week because next week we're going to talk about specific strategies and you're correct. I agree with you. A lot of it does come down to culture. The reason it's hard uh, is because of culture. And that is one of the things, one of the pillars that we're going to talk about in practical terms next week. So that's where I, I'm going to leave it on a cliffhanger for you. But yeah, that's what we're, one of the things we'll definitely cover. All right. Uh, do we have time for a poll guy or not? We probably don't really. Let's do the yeah, poll. Yeah, no, go for it. Let's do it. No, we'll do it. All right. Uh, yep. this is, is it, is it uh, I'm going to launch it. All right. Uh, hang this on. Launch, just... the, launch the wrong one. You launched the wrong one? That's a week one poll. Is it yes. in Yes. Did we put it, it in is. or do you need time to put it in? No, no. It's in there. There you go. Oh, there it is. Okay. So this is just which of the three is most common uh, in which your of organization? These, which of these categories of project trouble is most common in your organization? business case problems with goals or value justification, leadership challenges from decisions outside the project, or performance issues from within the project delivery. And a fairly even spread, actually. Leadership challenges just in front, though. Just, just inching ahead a little bit, yeah. If this was a first-past-the-post, they would win. They're still winning. Now, that's, that's going to be the winner. What are we at? About forty-five percent for leadership no. challenges. I wonder if we could do uh, uh, preferences in these polls. Anyway, uh, that'll do. We got yeah, close boys. to fifty percent now. Yeah, leadership challenges. You want to share that? Yep. There we go. There we go. Forty-six percent leadership, thirty percent business, and twenty-three percent performance. Yep. See, it's us project managers. It's not usually our fault, is it? 
It's, it's usually someone else. <laughs> All right, here's the summary. Uh, you already know what this is about. It's the poll. It's the three different things that we've talked about. So uh, I won't go into that in any more detail. Let's, I'll let Guy to talk a bit more about uh, CSU. Uh, I'll come back and right. talk about uh, homework. I'll be back in a few minutes. Beauty. Thanks, Brenton. Okay, uh, just a couple of quick minutes on Charles Sturt University. Our usual presenter is unavailable uh, due to a change in role and far less time to devote to, to giving beautiful presentations on the school that they love. Uh, so I'll have to do it for him. Uh, Charles Sturt University uh, has campuses around Victoria. There's uh, the entry requirements and there, um, for entry into a master's program, uh, bachelor's degree or higher, and those with industry experience coming through graduate certificate pathway. I'll go into the pathway in a little bit more detail soon. Um, but I'll just preface all of this next few moments with... All of this information will be on the Moodle page, the learn.itmasters.edu.au page. So if you have any questions about it or want to go into it in more detail, um, it'll all be there and, and there'll be contact details uh, for you to get in touch with people that know more about it than I do. I am a short course MC and it's not a, an eligibility slash applications person. Uh, as you can see, there's some links and emails there, uh, or some links, I should say, uh, to help you check whether you're eligible. Um, uh, gen generally, uh, eligibility isn't too much of a hurdle, and if you're not eligible, we can work with you um, to, to help you with a, a pathway into it. And this is a big part of how we do it. Um, as you can see, these are called nested awards, which means that uh, if you're not quite ready to enter into the full master's, you might be able to get into the graduate certificate. Uh, I believe everyone now just starts off with the graduate certificate subjects um, as, as uh, compulsory subjects. Uh, and then once those are passed, you can move on to the full masters and have a greater range of subjects at your, to, to choose from. Um, you can see there a qualification hierarchy, which I'm sure you're all aware of and don't need much explanation on. Slide, please. Thank you, Brenton. Okay, so this is the Master of Project Management program. Uh, a lot of these subjects, I imagine, Brenton, you have actually designed and <laughs> developed and delivered at some point in the last however long it's been. I, 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 I'm, I'm thinking more than half of them. Yeah. Very good. Quite a few. So if you do have any questions, feel free to chuck them in the forum. But as you can see, there's, there's a few to go with. Uh, and actually... Brenton is in the process or, or has just uh, developed a subject on on project recovery. So uh, uh, hopefully this will pique your interest and you might be interested in starting with that one. Uh, a few words on Charles State University. Uh, we really value distance education and learning by correspondence um, and online. As you can see, we are the market leader in, in, in those sorts of things and, and those stats are actually improving in our favor, improving in our favor, uh, becoming more dominant uh, in terms of market share. If you go to the next slide, Brenton. Uh, those figures are actually increasing in terms of our, our market share. I assume that, and I hope, uh, and we can infer from those facts that what we are doing is something that students enjoy and are getting benefits from. Um, we, we tend to focus a lot on, on making sure that the, a lot of the content is, is based on industry practices and, and with, with industry firmly in mind. Um, so, so you would have seen that there's a lot of academic subjects, but there's also a lot of industry-based subjects that can prepare you for certifications uh, and give you sort of training that will be really helpful in, uh, either in your existing employment or in gaining future employment. Um, so we really do, really do emphasize the, the links that we have to industry and trying to foster stronger links. Uh, time commitment, uh, if you're studying part-time, we, we say 10 hours per study, 10 hours of study per week is enough for each subject. Um, and as you can see, there's variable study loads, leaves us absences, and we can assist really in, in making sure that you, you're able to see it through. That's, that's a big part of, of our job is not just to, to get you in there, but to make it easy for you once you are in there to, to stick with it. Uh, and if you are having any, any problems, just to make sure that we can help you in, in seeing it through. Uh, 
Um, plenty of scope for earning credit for um, recognizing prior learning. Um, unfortunately, work experience um, is not something we do give credit for, but we certainly have a lot of scope for giving credit for industry certifications you might have done. Generally, if they're uh, less than 10 years old, uh, you, you will be able to apply for credit and it will be looked at favorably. And of course, previous postgraduate study is something that we look at as well. Costs, uh, I believe are still current. Uh, if they're not current, they're close to that. Basically for a 12 subject masters, you're looking at roughly $35,000. Um, and there's a lot of information, or there will be a lot of information on the on the Moodle page about the return on investment for that. Basically, if you do a master's, you can expect greater income uh, over the course of a 25-year career. So, uh, if it's if it's a financial decision, that's great. And if it's just something that you really are passionate about, then that is also great. Neil McCosh is a lovely man who you can talk to for more info. Uh, he's as mad as a gut snake truly wonderful to work with and has all sorts of knowledge on, on an incredible amount of certifications. So we'll be able to help you with credit inquiries, uh, application processes and assisting you throughout the, the duration of your study. If you choose to study with Charles Sturt University and IT Masters. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to go through uh, and, and go through the, the slides which are of course, available on the, on the Moodle page and post any questions in the forum or, or just contact us by the email in the slides. So that's a, a quick overview of, of, um, of what you can do if you really enjoy this sort of format and, and structure of courses. Uh, and of course, if you want to have more interaction with Brendan, you can choose the subjects that he's teaching. Um, <laughs> I don't. I don't teach all of them, but I have written a number of them. So you you still hear my voice from time to time in in some of the pre-recorded stuff. Um, but um, yeah, I don't, I don't teach all of them all the time. Um, but I am doing the next one next term, which is this subject, the pre uh, the pre what are the project recovery? Uh, that is one of the ones that we're just about to launch uh, in the next semester. Now, I know a number of people are probably ready to jump off and do something else. Uh, here is the, it's, it's meant to be topic two, sorry, oops. Uh, this is the forum activity post discussion. It's about uh, the, the project, a troubled project that you know or familiar with. And of the three different categories, uh, what was attempted or what should have been attempted? Uh, what happened, what could have happened? So theorize. Uh, how you might have used any of the tools here to have addressed or worked on any of the challenges with a troubled project that you know about uh, and share some thoughts on that. Uh, so next week, we are going to talk about uh, recovery techniques. We're going to go into some specifics about how to actually uh, put together a recovery. So a lot of what we talked about today is, is also a bit about where does uh, a troubled project really come from and how can we maybe keep the wolves at bay uh, next week, we're going to talk about what happens when you're officially going red and the world is suddenly different. And we're going to talk about, you know, the, the sledgehammer the, the, that happens at that point. This so, is going to be great. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's the week that everyone's sort of waiting for. It's sort of like, oh, let's, we, this is the way we get the really exciting things where uh, all of the really dramatic stuff happens. And yeah, it will be. Pay dirt. Pay dirt. Oh, sick. All right. Well, thank you, Chantel. Uh, thank you very much, everyone, for coming in. And thank you, of course, Brenton. Have a lovely week and I look forward to hearing from you next week. Thanks, everyone. And that's it from us for now. Thank you and good night.